It was the mid-1950s when the story of the hook man began to be told. It was a time when rock and roll music, or the devil's music as adults called it, started to be played by teenagers. Parking in lover's lane was common. And parents started to worry about the morals of the children at the time. The story first appeared in print in 1960 in a well-known column called Dear Abby, where a lady named Jeanette wrote in and retold the story saying that it had happened to a friend of hers. And the story? Well. A young couple pull up into Lover's Lane. They park, they start to canoodle, they tune in the radio a little for some romantic tunes. When an announcement comes over the radio, searching for a local fugitive known as the Hook Man, on the loose since escaping yesterday from the Maple Grove Mental Hospital and believed to be heading south. And though local activists are encouraging a town curfew, the mayor has not yet announced a plan. We're recommending all you lovebirds out there stay in groups and head home as soon as you can. The girl, being rather scared, says she wants to go home. As she looks into the rear vision mirror, <coughs> she sees the man with the hook. The boy turns the car on, and they race off, escaping the hook man's clutches. When the boy gets back home and goes around to open the door for the girl, he discovers his car has been scratched quite deeply. But to his horror, when he goes to touch the handle to open the door for his girlfriend, hanging on the door handle is a bloodied hook. The moral of the story, avoid the hook man, don't go parking. Educators and parents still tried to explain to the children that sexual activity was bad. You needed to say no. Take me home. Through her own experience, Mary was developing a sound ideal of what love should mean in her life. It was not what Jack offered. The year is 1946. There was a small town called Texacana, right on the border of Texas and Arkansas. There was a spate of horrific murders that took place and the killer was dubbed as the Phantom of Texacana, or the Phantom Killer, or the Phantom Slayer. He was credited with attacking eight people, five of them fatally, three escaped death. This all in a 10 week period. The attacks occurred at night between February 22nd and May 3rd, targeting couples parked in cars in secluded lovers lanes. However, the fourth attack occurred at an isolated farmhouse in Arkansas. The first attack, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry. They went out to the movies and dinner on a double date. And after on the way home, Jimmy made a slight detour. He and Mary Jean parked on the secluded Bowie County Road, just outside of Texacana. They were only there a few minutes when Jimmy decided, for whatever reason, to get out of the car and start gazing at the stars. Seemingly then, out of nowhere, a man appeared. He approached and he shone a torch in Jimmy's face. Jimmy also noticed the man had a gun. Jimmy's first thought was this man had made a mistake. He, he was mistaking himself and Mary for someone else. When he said this to the perpetrator, he was yelled at and he was told to drop his effing pants. Mary shouted, just do it, just do it. So Jimmy did it. The man then came close to Jimmy and hit him in the head. It is thought that he hit him in the head with either an iron bar or the gun. He hit him so hard that Mary Jean actually thought it was a gunshot. She thought he had shot Jimmy. 
That is how loud the noise of Jimmy's skull cracking was. The man then started to kick Jimmy in the chest and hit him again over the head. Once Jimmy was knocked out, the gunman turned his attention to Mary Jean. She thought they were being robbed. He asked her where her purse was. She said she didn't have one. He then hit her over the head with what she thought was a metal pipe. Then he shouted at her to run, which she did. She headed for a ditch, but then he shouted at her to run up the road, at which time he turned back and continued his attack on the unconscious Jimmy. Mary Jean ran. She ran till she came to a car, hoping that it could be help, but then she realised it was empty, probably the attacker's car. At this time, the attacker had caught up with her. He asked her, why are you running? She replied, because you told me to. He yelled at her, calling her a liar and hit her again in the head. Helpless on the ground, he attacked her. He used some kind of metal object to violate her. When he stopped, she got to her feet. She thought he was going to kill her. Then, luckily, car headlights shone their way, which, for whatever reason, scared him off. As soon as he was gone, she ran for help. She got to a farmhouse. Meanwhile, poor Jimmy had somehow regained consciousness and flagged down a passing car. Although both traumatised, Mary Jean and Jimmy lived to tell the tale. Jimmy spent eight days in hospital, but he recovered from his injuries. Both gave conflicting descriptions of the attacker. Jimmy said he was a white man, and Mary said he wore a bag over his head with the eyes cut out. Either way, there was not much to go on. Now the attack on Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. Unfortunately, they were not as lucky as the first couple. Richard Griffin had been in the Navy during the war and recently discharged. He started dating Polly Ann Moore. She worked at the local defence plant and both came from hard-working, loving families. On March 23rd, Richard picked Polly up and he took her out for dinner and a movie. It was a double date with Richard's sister and her boyfriend. After the movie, Richard took Polly for a drive. He parked about 50 yards off the highway in Lover's Lane. After a short while, another car drove up. A man walked up. He was unnoticed for a while, but then suddenly he brandished a handgun. He ordered Richard to drop his pants, which Richard did. Richard was inside the car on the back seat. And at this point, the perpetrator shot Richard in the back of the head twice. Then he turned his attention to Polly. She was forced from the car, shot twice in the back of the head outside on a blanket. It was unknown whether or not Polly had been violated. For some reason, he moved Polly's body back into the car and left her slumped in the front seat. The next morning, the couple were found by a passing driver who checked the car and discovered the horror inside. The police came, of course. Young Paul Martin was 17. He borrowed his brother's shiny Ford Coupe and drove a hundred miles to Texarkana. He was going to see his girl, Betty Jo Booker. He was going to take her out to the movies and a bite to eat. But that night she had to play saxophone in the local band and they didn't finish up until 1am. He was meant to take her home to drop off her saxophone and then take her to her friend's house where she was going to have a slumber party. He instead suggested they go park at Spring Lake Park. They hadn't been parked there for very long when a car drove up and a man got out, pointing a pistol at them. What eventuated after that is not very clear, but on the Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m., Mr. and Mrs. Weaver, locals, were driving into town and they saw young Paul lying on the side of the road. 
Mr Weaver didn't get out to investigate, instead he drove to the police station to alert the authorities. When the police arrived to the scene, they found Paul's car about a mile and a half down the road from his body. The poor boy had been shot four times, twice in the head, once in the chest and once through his hand. At this time, no one knew that Paul had been with Betty, so they weren't looking for her. However, later on, they were alerted to the fact that she was indeed with him and they started to search for her body. Her body was located in behind some trees a few yards off the lane. She'd been shot twice, once in the head and once through the heart. She was one mile away from Paul's body in the opposite direction and two miles away from the car. Later investigations had shown she too had been violated, although she was fully dressed at the time she was found. The last known attacks of this monster were on Virgil and Katie Starks. In 1946, they'd celebrated their 14th wedding anniversary. Virgil was 37 and so was Katie. They'd known each other all of their lives. They didn't have any children and they lived out on a farm, a little bit isolated, but they were one of the lucky families in the town that had electricity and an actual telephone. That night, Virgil was sitting in his chair, reading the newspaper. The window in the room was closed, but the light was on and the shade was up. He sat with his back to the window. Katie was upstairs getting ready for bed. She heard a noise outside in the backyard and she told Virgil to turn the radio down. If he heard her, she never knew. As minutes after she told him to do that, she heard what she thought was breaking glass. Wondering what Virgil had broken, she went downstairs. But unfortunately, there was Virgil, slumped over, blood on the floor. She rushed to him, she lifted his head and realised that he had been shot twice. She turned and raced for the telephone. The killer was still there looking at her through the window. She never got to use the phone. He fired two more shots through the window, hitting her. He hit her in the head. She fell to the floor and she laid there for a moment, still conscious, realizing that if she stood up, he would see her. So on her hands and feet, she crawled down the passageway through the kitchen towards the other end of the house. The intruder, however, while she was doing this, had made his way around to the kitchen window and was breaking in. All she managed to see of the killer was his leg as he was hopping through the kitchen window. She took off, she escaped, she got out of the house and she just ran for her life. Her sister lived across the road. When she got there, no one was home. Somehow she managed to run another 50 yards to the house next door to that and thankfully they were home. She was taken to the hospital and thankfully she survived. Investigations into the murders were conducted by the county, the city, the state and the FBI. Over time opinions shifted slightly in regards to the last murder of Virgil. Because a 22 was used to kill Virgil, yet the two murdered couples, the weapon of choice for those murders was a 32 calibre. So later on it was thought that Perhaps the Stark murder was not related to the Lover Lane attacks. They had a multitude of clues, nothing substantial. They had a footprint, fingerprints, palm print. They had the torch that was left behind by the killer at the Stark's farm. Tire tracks. And also... An interesting part of the case was the fact that letters were being sent to the detective Gonzalez that was investigating the case and they were cryptic, weird, odd sorts of letters. They never found the killer. They had suspects, plenty of suspects, 
Out of all of the suspects that they later cleared, Yul Swinney was their favourite, their main suspect. He was never charged, he was arrested for stealing a car and his wife was arrested along with him. His wife, for whatever reason, came up with the story that her husband was the phantom killer. Perhaps to get out of trouble for stealing the car, who knows. Either way, she told a story about how he murdered the couples. She was there for one of the murders. And the police did try to, to validate her story. But on investigation, on the night of the Booker Martin murders, it was found that the Swinneys were actually asleep in their car under a bridge in San Antonio. So Swinney was never charged with the murder and instead he was tried and imprisoned as a habitual offender for car theft. He got life for that. But he was released in 1973. So it's this story, the story of the phantom killer, that drove the Hookman story. But there's another story that this sounds so much like. Do the killings of the couple remind you of anything? 1968, the Zodiac Killer started another reign of terror. His first two victims, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Possibly they were ordered out of the car by the responsible. The boy was shot right at this side of the car the girl apparently tried to run and she was shot and found 28 feet further on the next couple were Michael Madhu and Darlene Farron they'd gone on a date and Darlene had driven out of town in the direction of Lake Herman Road. Shortly just before midnight, she turned her car into the parking lot of the Blue Rock Springs Park. Not long after she arrived, another car pulled up and parked. The unknown driver turned the headlights off on his car and sat still for a little while, just at the steering wheel. Maju asked, who the driver was and Farron vaguely replied to not be worried about it. The other driver then left and they were alone. Five minutes later the driver returned and parked just a few feet next to Farron's car. He got out of his car, approached Farron's car and then he shone a flashlight at them. The couple assumed it was a police officer and the boy rolled down the window. Apparently, the man did not speak, and he fired the gun into the car. One bullet hit Madhu in the right arm, and the other hit Farron in the neck. Madhu tried to leave the car, but the door handle on the passenger's side was missing or, or broken. The killer stepped away from the car and went back to his own. He didn't leave straight away. Instead, he opened his car door and did something that Madhu couldn't see. He looked back at Michael and saw that he was struggling to get out of the car and moved quickly back toward him. He fired four more shots, two at Michael and two at Darlene. Not long after the shooting, three teenagers drove into the parking lot, saw the wounded couple and they left to get help. The police arrived at the scene at 12.20 a.m. and started to investigate. Farron was pronounced dead at the hospital at 12.40 and Michael survived. Not long after the shooting, the police department received a phone call from a public telephone just two blocks away from the shooting. Vallejo Police Department. I want to report a double murder. Yeah, yeah, you you stole one mile east on Columbus Parkway. Public park. You'll find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Good. I... The next attack, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepherd. They were picnicking on a small island connected by a sand split to Twin Oak Ridge. A man, 
about 5 foot 11 inches weighing around 170 pounds approached the couple he was wearing a hood he had clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes and some kind of bib on his chest that had a cross circle symbol on it the hooded man approached them with a gun he demanded that Brian tie Celia up Brian thought that he was trying to rob him but apparently he didn't want anything like that Celia Shepard and Brian Hartnell both in their early 20s oh just a hooded man came up with a pistol drawn on him tied him up and then told him he had to kill him so I considered him a robber I had absolutely no thought uh, that he was anything but that he stabbed Brian six times and Shepard was stabbed ten times killer then hiked 500 yards up the road he drew a cross circle symbol on Brian's car door with a black felt tip pen and wrote beneath it the dates of the other killings at 7 40 p.m. the killer called the Napa County Sheriff's Department from a payphone at a car wash in town he first said that he wanted to report a murder then he changed it to no a double murder before telling the operator that it was he who had committed the crime luckily after hearing the victim's screams for help a man and his son fishing in a nearby cove discovered Hartnell and Shepherd and got help by contacting the park rangers around two weeks later Paul Stein was driving his taxi cab in downtown San Francisco when he picked up a passenger, a white male passenger. The passenger requested to be driven to the intersection of Washington and Maple Streets in Presidio Heights. When they arrived, the passenger asked to be driven one block down to Washington and Cherry Streets. The reason for the request is unknown. Stein then drove the distance and at approximately 9.55 p.m. Stein was shot in the head with a handgun. It likely killed Stein immediately. The Zodiac then took Stein's wallet and car keys. This was the last officially confirmed murder by the Zodiac. Now I'll get to why I've mentioned the Zodiac killings at the end of this episode of The Hookman. So I'll start off by explaining that the composite sketch that everybody is used to seeing, that was created from the three teenagers that were overlooking the Washington and Cherry intersection in the moments just after Paul Stein was shot in his taxi cab. But as we've learnt over the years and with crime, eyewitness recollections aren't very reliable. So what conclusions have I come to? In my personal opinion, just a theory. After researching the Phantom Killer, I just was fascinated by the fact that the Phantom Killer's killings were almost exact in MO to that of the Zodiac Killer. And when I looked into the Zodiac Killer and the suspects, I found Jack and I found Jack because his stepson Dennis Kaufman went to the police and the FBI after his stepfather's death and told them he was sure that his stepfather was the Zodiac Killer. The identity of the Zodiac Killer is Jack Torrance, he's my stepfather. He produced evidence, he produced tapes where Jack confessed to the killings, he produced coded letters. And most interestingly, he produced a hood, which he found hidden and rolled up in an old amplifier. The FBI did perform DNA tests on the items that were supplied by Kaufman. They did a handwriting analysis as well. Interestingly, they came back inconclusive. So we haven't really ruled Jack out or in. I would have loved to have spoken to Dennis Kaufman, but unfortunately he passed away in 2018. So in my research, I decided to find out a little bit more about Jack. So I did find out that at the time of the 
Texacana murders, guess who lived in Texas? That's right, Jack Terrence. Jack Terrence lived in Texas. He was born in Texas and he did live there at the time of the murders. And at the time of the Zodiac killings, he lived in California. So in my little opinion, and I have learnt since that other people are of a similar opinion that Jack Terrence probably was the Zodiac killer and he confessed to it on the promise that Kaufman would not release that information until his death. He would have been 18, almost 19 at the time that the first murders, the phantom killings, took place. I got the whole thing on tape. Your Remember? conversations with Jack? Yes, I do. And he admits to being the Zodiac. Yes, he does. So I'll leave you to ponder that. And I can leave you with the surety that there is no hook man that comes and attacks a car when you park in Lover's Lane. However, I cannot assure you that some homicidal maniac isn't going to attack you. Thanks for watching.